When chef and raconteur Graham Kerr first galloped across your television screen, he had a Julia Child penchant for lots of buttercream, fat, and fun. Well, he's still a lot of fun, but he's pared down his enthusiasm for two rich foods and embraced his new gardening passion. His new book is about that passion. He is one of the featured speakers at Eat Vancouver, and it is my pleasure to welcome the still galloping gourmet to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Yes, I know, isn't it? but that was radio. It was radio, yes. so nobody saw you but me, <laughs> but they heard you. Mm. Thank you. Who first called you the Galloping Gourmet? Well, actually, Qantas Airlines decided in a, in a major moment of, of fun to give two men, myself and Len Evans, who is a famous wine writer, yes. a free trip around the world and pay for every restaurant we ate in for 31 days to, to mark their beginning of going around the world. And they would pick up that tab. We ate in 117 <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> Ooh, and they good. poured us off the plane at the end. Uh -huh. And they, all they wanted was a book. And the book that uh, we wrote was called The Galloping Gourmets. And um, as we were midway through, I thought to myself, what an incredible idea for a TV mm -hmm. series. World ranging, you know, different dishes every day. And because my accent is relatively ubiquitous, Mm -hmm. um, it could go back over the world, it, and we, it did. It went worldwide sure. because of that. And I remember you leaping over that chair. <laughs> you were always leaping somewhere, <laughs> and clanging pots and pans, yes. and cooking, yes. of course. Uh, but you were raised with hoteliers, right? Your parents were in the hotel business. Yes. Fifteen, you were at the Roebuck Hotel. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and at that stage, it was listed as the 12th best small hotel in England. See? And, uh, and there weren't very many good mm. hotels, especially small ones in England sure at that not, time. I'm sure not, but the Royal Ascot. Didn't the, you work there yes, too? Yes, I, I actually, with Trina, was the general management of that hotel. Okay, and Trina is your lovely wife, and you obviously love her because you very have uh, gone away from your butter binge yes. onto a little healthier path. Uh, I, I su substantially <laughs> healthier <laughs> path. Um, I, I only thought of people really as a dotted line and the neck up. You know, it was a sensual process. And, and in the business, if you're in the business as a, as a cook, then you want your customers to come back and you mm -hmm. seduce them with mm -hmm. the idea that if they come back, they will have a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And you really can't say, I'm going to give you a healthy, wonderful experience. The two don't really go together. And we have to say, healthy but delicious. Ah, actually. I want to be able to do this. I want to delight and do less harm. Mm. I think that, and, and I'm asking chefs to join me in that one. In fact, they're doing it of their own. I don't really right. need to tell them to do that. That this whole local and fresh business is all about delighting and doing less harm. Exactly, and yeah. it's ocean wise. As you know, yeah. we're getting a lot smarter and you don't have to have a hospital meal for no. it to be healthy. In fact, no. hospital meals aren't all that healthy, you may have noticed. <laughs> but uh, 29 books in. Yeah. Is that how many? 29. 29 yes. books in. Yes. Uh, you've now gone to the garden. Yes, I've gone to the garden. Uh, why? Well, um, initially because I, I, I'm, I'm part of a very small Christian fellowship um, and we wanted to ask God how we might be able to help our community in 2008 which was very depressed, you know, with the, the depression sure. situation. The subprime or? Yeah, we, 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 we're only 80 odd people, but is there anything that we can do to make mm -hmm. this place a little happier and, and hope, more hopeful? And we took eight weeks to pray about it. And the final um, thing that came out with which we all agreed, people need to eat more plants. People need to get outside and do something which is rewarding, like garden, you know, mm -hmm. and dig up and, pl and plant something you can right. eat. And people need to do that together with their neighbors in their neighborhood so as to be able to have a common ground of enjoying one sure. another. Sure, back to the land, back, back to the heart. Hello, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It and makes so sense. That, that's, and I've never met a plant I couldn't kill. I mean, truly, uh, uh, right. you too. I mean, <laughs> Do my, I look like a plant was to designed, you? This is pure poison, this is one. Is it? Yeah. Just not the green thumb? None. And so I thought to myself, this I can't do. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, this is what we're hearing, so I'm going to go do it and I'm going to ask some friends. Sure, you help. knew nothing about raised nothing, beds nothing, or... Nothing, nothing. I started at ground zero, literally. I had a, 
I had a lawn full of dandelions, <laughs> which which, which you can eat. Which, frankly, <laughs> if I had known in season, they get seven dollars oh. a pound down there. Down my pound. I could have made a fortune mm. on my lawn. But I, I killed it all off and dug it all up and got wonderful friends. I must tell you that some of the most gracious people in the world are gardeners. They're amazing people. They're very humble because the climate out mm. there is going to determine sure. what your garden's going to be like. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in being prideful about it. No. Cooks are fairly prideful, but gardeners aren't. And when you cook what you garden, it's even better, right? Oh, I had no idea. I oh. thought I could cook. But until I had grown that French heirloom carrot and mm. pulled that little fellow out of the ground, I, didn't, I found out you don't have to peel it because its skin is so tender. Mm -hmm. And I washed it and I steamed it. And I remember having the timer on and watching that timer and, and prodding this thing so as to make sure it was just perfect. Mm -hmm. And I ate that thing. And it had the, the sugars had matured over the season. And oh, man, you see? that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. You weren't raised on a farm, that's clear. <laughs> you never plucked a tomato in the heart of London or wherever you were. But you can make a velvet omelet with a parsnip or something. There's something yes. you put in the sauce. This is today, and this is the first day that this kind of omelet preparation has been known in the entire world. At this, last. Yeah, that last, yes. <laughs> well, I, it may stop here, uh, <laughs> or it may just go. Mm -hmm. You know the omelette is a marvelous golden creation, yes. and it's so quick and simple mm -hmm. to do. So I'm going to do the classic French omelette, which runs about 580 calories and has 35 grams of saturated fat in it. By the, that's one and a half days for the average person on a 2,000 calorie a day diet. So. Then I'm going to uh, lay that up and have someone out of the audience to taste that. And I'm going to try and get a chef to eat it from one end and a member of the public to eat it from the <laughs> That's other. That's great. You know. It's a big omelet. Uh, yeah, well, fairly big, uh, three <laughs> eggs, which is mm. fairly big. Then I'm going to make one with um, an egg substitute plus an egg because that ne is needful okay. for texture. And then I'm going to make this sauce with parsnips which are well steamed, put into a blender with evaporated skim milk and whizzed up at very high speed for about four minutes. Now, it sounds like it's overdoing it and it's noisy and, and I wish I could make it less. But I was on the phone the first time this happened with somebody and I had that phone which tells you how long you've been on the phone and I was, I'd left the blender running. This is complete action. Right. I came back and there is this amazing substance in this blender. Mm. The plant cellulose and the milk proteins, I've been trying to get scientists to explain what happened. Whatever they did, they became one. And they, they got and they're married. velvet. They're what? They got married. Oh, they did? Yes, well, yes, I, well I didn't want to be as phone. personal as that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's just like um, an Alfredo sauce. Wow. Um, it's extraordinary. But better for you. Yeah. Oh, no fat. I mean, it's extraordinary. And it's mm. I don't know whether you like parsnips, but if you don't like parsnips, I love parsnips. Sweet, I'm one of the few. Sweet, sweet potatoes can mm -hmm. be done. Peas can be done in the same way. Really? It's brilliant so you puree the pea sauce. within an inch of its life, or what do you do? No, 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 I know no, it's no, in here. No, you, you put it in absolutely fresh, frozen, you know, the frozen pea, throw okay. it in the blender with the evaporates, and just turn it on. Really? Yeah. That's it? And it's, it's wonderful. So then you coat the entire omelet with that sauce. Right. A little cheese on the top, a little paprika. And then when you eat it, you have this lusciousness mm. that you get. It's more than just the baveurs of mm -hmm. a good omelet, but it's just luscious. And it's nutty, and it's just a little sweet and, and tender. And it is just beautiful. Well, it sounds you. beautiful. Yes. I'm sure it tastes beautiful <laughs> because you do a lot with veg in here, as you know. That cauliflower yeah. dish, you have a cauliflower with a carrot cheese sauce. Yes. Am I to imagine that there's no cheese in the carrot so cheese sauce, or there is? Um, there's just a scattering of cheese always. It's good parmesan scattered on at the last moment over a mm. hot sauce will give you the, 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 the aroma comes off the dish. So you smell the cheese, you look at it, everything about it says cheese sauce, except that it's not riddled right through it. How great. What about the bees on that tie? <laughs> these, the bees. The, the, these are um, called um, uh, mason bees. Right. 
and mason bees make their little uh, nests and only go out about 180 to 300 feet away from where, where they um, settle. And they pollinate everything in sight. They're great pollinators. Mm -hmm. The bumblebee kind of crash lands into, <laughs> in, right. into a flower. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 this fella sure. goes out and deliberately collects pollen and deposits it in their nest so that they can, that, that their young Of can course, feed you on. can bring Italian bees in. They're probably mason bees, I'm not sure, but they do the same. And the uh. bumbles, I don't know, they're bumbling. I'm not, they're doing some good. But as you know, as, as we're using too much pesticide and herbicide and all of that, some yeah. of the bees are dying, the birds are dying. Yes. Uh, yes. Tougher to grow a garden today. The soil's not as good. Are you organic? I am. I feel strongly for the soil because mm. if we don't take care of that properly and allow it to be what it is designed to be, then we perish as you a human bet. race. And we must save those seeds and those heritage Absolutely. seeds are important, all of that. So take me to this book, Entertaining with Care. Yes. And that's not C-A-R-E, that's you, because that's you're me. English, that's right? right? Sc and Scottish, actually. Scottish. Are you Scottish originally? <laughs> oh, man, I, I oh, fight man. you over this desk. <laughs> ah, you see, I thought you were born in the England. You were born I in the Scotland. I was born in England. I'm a London-born Scot. Yeah. A London-born Scot. My mother couldn't get back across the border oh, in time. Oh, that. I. I. <laughs> I. Well, the Rabbi Burns will understand, don't I. you think? I. Uh, frying batter, listen to this. Uh, Cornish oysters, yum. Tamati waka. Huh? Tamati waka nini. Tamati waka nini. That's New Zealand. Well, yes. you spent time in New Zealand. We did, and this book was published first of all in New Zealand. Okay, seafood I, cocktail. I I'm can the only make person that. you will ever meet with a 100 rating on television. Really? Or every set in the nation watching me. 50 no. television sets in the whole country wow, when I started. Wow, that's huge. Just 50. That's <laughs> huge. 50 televisions on, black and white. Yes, <laughs> and, and no tape machine. No, oh, all live. That's why you're live. doing all that leaping. Yes, and, and, that. I, and I made an omelet first time on television. And so it worked out. Did you add a little water to it? Do you add a little water to your omelet to I the add eggs? Cream to it. Cream. Yeah. Oh, so you did it all. Mm -hmm. Now, growing at the speed of life, a year in the life of my first kitchen garden is a delight. Uh, why do you have an H? H is the letter which separates from treat and threat. Okay. Only the letter H, you take it out of the word threat and it becomes the word treat. Okay. And so what I've been doing is saying, then what is the letter H and what does that represent? What threatens mm -hmm. us about our daily food? Right. It's the portion size and how often we have a too large portion for our specific okay. body. So what I've done with Trina is I have simply reduced the threat in her life with about 36 foods. That's all we are threatened by. And I've got that on my personal website on GrahamCare.com. I have a list of the 36 foods in different portion sizes so people can select their own portion for their own life. How great. So eat less, mostly fruits and vegetables, and we can go to the exactly. site, your site, and do it or see you at Eat Vancouver when you're making that omelet. Yeah, absolutely. The two-ended omelet. Uh, a two-ended omelet. <laughs> yes, that's very good. <laughs> All right, How nice to you. see you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Graham Care will be at Eat Vancouver Food and Cooking Fest, and that's June 10th. That's tonight through the 12th.